Hello, hello everyone and welcome. Welcome back for those of you who've been here throughout the week. Uh, this is part of our 2022 Research for the Public Good Conference, which is our internal research conference at APUS, where we are highlighting faculty in student research and just supporting research in general. As Kelsey noted just before we started, we have some additional live presentations this week. Uh, and if you look at our event site, we also have some on-demand presentations that are pre-recorded, as well as some student lightning talk presentations, which are part of our competition for student lightning talks. And you can go and vote on those as part of that competition. So thank you for being here. And we're very happy this morning to have Dr. Melissa Schneider presenting as part of her faculty research grant project from last year. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa Schneider. Great, thank you, Kelsey, and thank you, Dr. Douglas. Welcome, everybody. Um, uh, thank you for joining me today. I hope everybody's doing well this morning or afternoon, wherever you happen to be. Today, I'm going to be presenting on my 2021 research grant project, and that project was called How Global Norms Are Applied at the Local Level to Frame and Promote Environmental Sustainability. I do have some notes here on a separate computer. So if I'm kind of like looking back and forth, that's why I just to let you know. Uh, so the focus of this research project is on what are called global environmental twilight norms. And these norms or principles, right, encompass the seven norms that we see here on the screen. And so uh, I was really focusing on uh, these seven sets. So precaution, polluter pays, common but differentiated responsibilities, equitable util utilization of shared natural resources, intergenerational equity, common heritage of humankind, and sustainable development. And I'll go through those a little bit in a second. Um, but for now, the this was my project was taking these seven norms as a starting point. In the and also working with the observation in the literature that there is considerable confusion still concerning the role that these specific twilight norms play in environmental governance and concerning the effect that they have um, uh, not only at the international level, but also uh, at the local level. And so this research was really aiming to better understand how these global level environmental norms are translated um, and incorporated into different local contexts. And I'm not going to, this is just a, a kind of a big table on those different norms. I'm not going to go over all of them, but just I'm going to pull out a couple that we, we all may be familiar with. So the principle of polluter pays, for example, uh, says that those who pollute the environment are responsible for bearing the costs of the damage and also must repair that damage. So it's a principle of international law that's been incorporated into uh, treaties and, and soft law instruments at the international level. Um, along with these other norms. So intergenerational equity is another one that some of us might be familiar with. Um, so it says that the environment and natural resources should be used in a way that ensures their preservation uh, for the benefit of future generations. So looking ahead into the future. Okay, and the last one I'll pull out that we all are probably familiar with is this idea of sustainable development. And that is in the context of economic growth, the environment must be preserved for future generations while also meeting the uh, economic and developmental needs of the present. Okay, so th these are just some of the more common uh, ones that I've just touched upon that are reflected at the international level in international treaties and, and other things like that. And so my goal was to see, are these also used, uh, incorporated at all these ideas at the local level? Okay, and so, the focus and research questions. Um, so the research focus was really examining this broad process of norm diffusion, what's called norm diffusion in the literature. So in other words, how norms travel. Um, in the literature, though, a lot of the focus on, on norm diffusion looks at how they travel across international institutions or organizations, so from one to the other. But I wanted to see how they travel from the global level down to the local level. And so I, uh, the research also analyzes how these global level environmental norms then are localized. So 
it's a concept from the literature, meaning really just how they are adapted and applied by stakeholders operating at the local level. And so I focused on three cases of local multi-stakeholder gov environmental governance uh, in France in this country context. And so for the specific research questions, I was looking at which global norms are evident in each of the, the local contexts that I examined in France. How are the global level norms translated and adapted to each local setting involving environmental governance? And how, if at all, are global environmental norms being used to influence social and political change more broadly uh, in these, these different local environments? Okay, so I was using a multiple case study research design. And so I'm gonna just talk a little bit now about each of the three cases that I examined. And so case number one was called the Serre Bear Banuels Marine Nature Reserve, the MNR. Um, this was founded in France in 1974, making it the first natural marine reserve in France and also then the oldest. Um, so in the early the context, in the early 1970s, the local community in the Cerber Banuels region uh, came together. They uh, negotiated and formalized some basic management rules to help maintain and preserve their marine area over time. And what was happening to, to prompt that was that um, they, they really perceived that these formal management rules were needed at this point in time because of the degradation of the marine environment that was happening due to increases in tourism. And so today the local community is still involved in managing this marine reserve, although its formal management has shifted and falls now with the regional government there, but there are lots of different stakeholders involved in this particular case. So we've got the local citizens who are involved, the regional government, um, also scientific experts, um, and uh, and others who serve on specific committees to help manage and um, and preserve this this natural resource. The second case that I looked at was uh, the what's called the Tow Fisheries Local Action Group, so the flag. Okay, and the Tow flag covers an area along the Mediterranean Sea, and it has two important fishing harbors one in Ogd and one in Set, and I was able to visit the one in Set uh, this past summer. And so this flag's strategy involves promoting local economic activities. It's really an engine. We can think of this flag as an engine for community-led local development. And so it focuses on promoting local economic activities while also trying to balance the unique environmental assets and challenges that the area is facing at the same time. And so some of the specific challenges that this flag uh, is, is aiming to address center on uh, creating and maintaining jobs and businesses in the fishery sector, and also strengthening the importance of fishery and aquaculture activities within the territory, uh, while also at the same time ensuring sustainable development. And so this particular area is experiencing a few different environmental challenges uh, involving water quality, and sustainable management of land use. And these challenges in particular have been exacerbated over time also by the increase in, in tourism, uh, sp specifically over the past decade or so. And so this flag involves also a lot of different stakeholders, about 75 individuals and organizations uh, who work in partnership um, to govern and manage uh, this flag territory. And the, these stakeholders involve a mix of fisheries actors, public authorities, um, NGOs and other citizens groups and environmental experts. Okay, and then the last case that I looked at is uh, the bio district. And this is uh, called the, the Bio Valley Bio District. And just to, to give you some information on what a bio district is, um, these are territories where uh, farmers, citizens, associations, um, public authorities, they enter into this a formal agreement for the sustainable management of local resources. And so the idea behind the bio district is to create and reinforce these links between these actors, these stakeholders that benefit, that end up benefiting everybody involved. So for example, 
uh, in the Bio Valley Bio District, organic farmers would get better market access. Um, consumers would benefit from transparency about where their food is coming from, the origins of their food, and have access to uh, organically grown local food, uh, which is in demand in this particular area. And the, the tourist operators are also involved here. They, they um, have started to offer new activities, new destinations, including eco trails and agro-tourism farm visits. Um, while at the same time, the public authorities benefit because they're able to ensure food security and employment in a particularly rural area. So rural employment was a, a big deal. And this, this um, bio district um, agreement has helped with that. So this particular bio district was founded in 2009. It's the only one in France um, consisting of an association of municipalities in the Drôme Valley region, which is uh, located in, in the Rhone Alps region of France. And it encompasses about, um, the region itself encompasses about 54,000 inhabitants across 102 small towns and villages. And so um, some of the stakeholders, the more important, the more relevant and active stakeholders that are involved here include elected officials, farmers, entrepreneurs, and some civil society organizations. Uh, in terms of the methodology, so the, the main method I'm using is uh, semi-structured interviews. And so the idea is to talk to these local stakeholders involved in the environmental governance and management of each of these three cases. Okay, so um, after doing the interviews, um, I've been using narrative analysis to look for insights within each interview and then compare and contrast different interpretations across interviews in, uh, in order to synthesize the information to help address the research questions that way. Uh, I've also had to combine this with content analysis. It turns out there are a lot of documents out there specific to each of these cases of environmental governance. And so when possible, I've been triangulating the interview notes with meeting minutes, background documents specific to each case, and also institutional websites. And the purpose of that content analysis is really to help hone in on identifying the presence or absence of those seven global twilight norms that I had talked about earlier. And then the interviews are used to more so, more so to, um, to probe a little bit deeper into how those norms have been localized. Okay, so uh, in terms of the preliminary findings, a couple of caveats here. So in 2021, which is the, the period of time that this project covers, um, I was able to engage more in informal conversations as opposed to semi-structured interviews and, and a lot of document analysis. And that was due mainly to COVID-19 and the impact that that still had in France. Uh, so many of my interviews had to be uh, canceled and then postponed until this year when I picked back up with this research project. And so I picked back up with this project um, and was able to conduct some of these interviews uh, over the summer of 2022. And again, in um, wrapping them up in September of 2022. So it's a bit of a work in progress. The findings are still being compiled. I'm still making sense of everything, but what I'm seeing so far uh, are a few processes of norm adaptation that these local stakeholders are using in order to take specific global level norms, uh, specifically the, sustain the uh, sustainable development norm and then a couple of other norms that I'll talk about in a minute and uh, adapt those. They're taking those global ideas and adapting them um, specifically to fit the local context. And so how are they doing that? Well, I'm seeing uh, this process called grafting in a few cases. And this has been written about in the literature on norm diffusion a lot. Um, and it's basically is a tactic used by stakeholders at the local level to help institutionalize a new norm from outside. So in this case, from the global level, by associating it with a pre-existing norm in the issue area. And that ensures that that global norm will help resonate um, at the local level with a pre-existing sort of their pre-existing context, the local normative framework that's already in place. And so I've seen that tactic being used specifically uh, when when stakeholders talk about the intergenerational equity norm, that global level norm, and how they graft it or link it with this very, very local norm of preserving cultural heritage, which is really, really strong in um, 
the first case that I mentioned, the, the Marine uh, Nature Reserve, um, this norm, local norm of preserving cultural heritage is a very strong norm that sort of governs the, the management of this nature reserve. And so uh, the stakeholders will explicitly link these two norms together to help resonate, um, to help communicate the importance of preservation uh, to the local public. Uh, I've also seen the sustainability so the sustainable development norm being grafted or linked to the local norm of buy local. Uh, we're all familiar with the buy local norm, and it's it's also present, in, especially in the the tow flag. The fisheries local action group is where I see this um, happening, um, where uh, a lot of the fisheries actors are pressing and pushing for um, more of uh, the people in covered by that that region that the flag governs to buy local buy local fish. Um, right now, most of their catch is exported. And so they're trying to flip that and, and promote this buy local norm by linking it specifically with sustainable development and communicating that to the public. Um, framing is another tactic that I'm seeing, and that's uh, uh, from the literature when we use acts of framing. Local citizens, they take this outside global norm and they present it in a way that emphasizes its specific value at the local level to local stakeholders. And in doing so, they make some aspects of the norm, the global norm, more salient than others. So they emphasize certain things. And here, the uh, the way that I'm seeing that applied is, oh, sorry, is uh, the sustainable development norm in particular is being framed um, by local stakeholders as a matter of ensuring the continuation and strength of the local marine culture and local fishery activities. So uh, in the flag, again, I'm seeing uh, the stakeholders involved in that, taking this norm of sustainable development and pulling out specific components of it to try to frame sustainable development as a matter of local survival, cultural su survival and uh, local fisheries survival. So I anticipate compiling more findings as I go through my notes, <laughs> but for now, this is what I'm seeing is a lot of grafting and a lot of framing processes. And um, that is how these norms are being adapted to the, the local context. And so for next steps, I mentioned that I was able to uh, finish up conducting those interviews this year, and I'm compiling these additional examples and findings right now. And uh, so I anticipate being able to present again about the final outcome of this, um, perhaps at this time next year. And the outcome of this project um, is anticipated to be a book published by Springer Nature in 2023 called Adapting Global Environmental Norms in Local Context in France. Thank you. That wraps up my presentation. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to address them now. Hey, Melissa, uh, yes. I'd like to ask a question. That's very interesting. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, the bio districts uh, in this France, it is really, really interesting. Are, have you looked at bio districts in, in America? Uh, is that or is that something else? And especially for sustaining, you know, the fisheries in the U.S., not not farming or wheat or anything. But I like you focused on fisheries. So uh, what are the bio districts in the United States uh, and how it relates to uh, what was the word framing? Mm -hmm. In the fisheries? Yeah, that's a great question. I have not examined the, any bio districts in the U.S. context, although I will say that part of my my uh, my goals in my research are to uh, take some of these cases and processes that I see applied in the European Union context and compare them to the United States context and, and Canada as well. So I try to have this transatlantic um, focus in my research. This has really been a project that's taken uh, a couple of years just to get to these preliminary findings. And so I think that that's, that might be something that I look at down the road is to compare the bio districts um, and the norms that they're using and adapting in France to what we see in the United States. And also in Canada, North America in general would be an interesting way to um, extend this. I'll also say that bio districts, they're, um, even though there's only one in France, I'm not sure how many there are in the United States, but I know that they exist. And 
they're really prevalent though in, in Italy and that's, I believe where they started. Um, and so that would also be uh, another case to examine is in the Italian context, because there are just so, there are so, so many of them um, all over the country. And so um, to answer your question though, I've not looked at it in the US context, but think it would be worthwhile for sure to do so and, and to have a comparative analysis. Oh yeah, I think so. You'd have to go to New Orleans and you know, and California and Texas and Massachusetts and might as well go to Kansas just to see what Midwest is like. <laughs> but uh this sounds like a good dissertation project. I swear to God, you got some good stuff here comparing the the uh the global norms. I never heard of them and the uh, twilight norms. I, I never heard of them. I really appreciate you doing this work for bringing this to us. Uh Thank you very much. But yeah, the U.S. sounds like a good next step. What's your 2023 research plan then? What are you uh, going to so, research plan? So for 20, 2022 is when I actually finished this, right? And so this is will all be wrapped up by next month. And then I will present in 2023, right, uh, on my 2022 experience. So I'll be able to come extend on these findings. And for 2023, I'm actually switching focus a little bit um, and um, and doing a completely different project. But what I'm hoping though, is that I think you're right that this, you know, this is um, something that could be turned into a dissertation. So I kind of push my, my students in the doctoral program to kind of get familiar with this literature on norms. So far, nobody's taken it up, but uh, I can't really understand why, because there's so much great research potential, (laughs) especially doing comparative studies. So, I think your idea is a good one. Yeah, well, uh, I work in supply chain and logistics. That means, you know, moving stuff like seafood caught in the North Atlantic and everything else and over in France, over here in America. And like the the Gulf shrimp we eat out of the Gulf of Mexico comes from Vietnam now, thanks to the Mm -hmm. BP oil spill. So maybe you can link it into supply chain. Hey, that's a good (laughs) idea too. I I do have students interested in that. So that's another angle that, um, that would be interesting to pursue for sure. I really like this. This is really exciting. I never Thank heard you. of it. Thank, Thank you for you. bringing it to my attention. Thank you. I had a question, Melissa, that's more just about conducting field research like this in general. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're identifying these cases and you're thinking about conducting interviews, just for people who maybe haven't haven't done a lot of this type of field research, how did you actually go in and identify the people or did you know in advance for sure who you needed to interview to answer the question? I did not know in advance. And that's a really good question. And it was hard uh, work identifying the people for these three cases, just because they are so localized, each three, each of these three, that there just isn't a lot out there um, on them. Um, the Bio Valley Bio District, I was a bit, I was luckier with that one because they have a website and their stakeholders are listed there. And so that one wasn't as hard, but especially for the, the Marine Nature Reserve, I mean, this isn't a really remote area and uh, it's just, there's not a lot out there on the web. And so I was able to just do some preliminary research to find background documents on the creation, uh, for example, of the Marine Reserve in that case. On its creation and and um, and who manages it now, and that was my starting point to to know that okay, there are citizens that are still involved that were involved in its creation and that are still involved in its management. I was able to see uh, who's taken it over uh, and that it's now managed by the regional government there. And from there, um, by probing through the regional government a little bit more, I was able to identify some scientific experts that serve on committees that help um, manage the the resource. So that's, you know, it was just kind of a trail uh, starting with one set of actors and uh, leading me to others. And for the the Fisheries Local Action Group, I was a little bit luckier with that one too, because that was, that particular local group stemmed from an initiative at the European Union level. So in coming out of Brussels um, to help organize these fishery actors and to fund them. Uh, to give them a budget really so that at the local level, they could take that budget, the the flag itself could take that uh, budget and fund local development projects that they decide to fund. And so uh, through tracing some of those projects, I was able to identify um, the the important people involved. So that's a good question though. 
Yeah, thank you. It sounds like a big detective project. Just yeah, to for sure. Who those people should be. Thanks. Well, that's one more question. Yeah. How does this pandemic, the last mm -hmm. two years, impact your study and your findings from these uh, uh, bio districts? How does this, how does this pandemic impact, and you think? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so it's probably um, it's impacted uh, for sure uh, in, in the sense of my own ability to to get information from stakeholders because so many of them just weren't were not available. They had other priorities that they had to attend to, and, and doing an interview with me was very very low, <laughs> obviously on their priority list. So uh, that's why this, this timeline has just been extended and extended and extended. And I think. Um, for the bio district, they've experienced obviously right a decrease in in tourism, and that's a big um, a big part of the bio district is these these agreements between some of the tour operators and the farms and uh, some of the restaurants who who get produce from the farms, and so they all work as a system. And so right when when there are no people coming, obviously um, economic worries boil up to the the forefront, and uh, doing research with me gets pushed to the back burner. So it was, it impacted the project that in that sense. Um, I think that um, I'm not sure the, the fisheries local action group had the same impact. They have fi fishing uh, auction, a fishing auction that was continuing to operate through the pandemic. Um, and then for the third case, the, uh, the Marine nature reserve, um, they, they, their operations, I don't think were, were severely impacted by the pandemic, but their tourism, you know, people coming to the Marine Nature Reserve to do snorkeling, and there's an underwater trail that you can see there. Um, all of that was obviously impacted as well. And so I think it, obviously, it shifted people's priorities in a way that um, made me extend my research timeline um, a great deal. Well, I can't wait to see you, the next, right thing next thing. <laughs> and supply and supply chain in. That's a supply chain problem. Yeah, for sure. It, that that is a definite issue. The tourists, yes. The tourists are buying it. They're trying to catch it. It's piling up. That's a supply chain. So add that in there. <laughs> I, I'm hoping I could get one of my students who are interested in that in supply chain to take that up. That's a great, uh, that's a great suggestion. Me too. I'd like one of my supply chain people to come in and talk about fish one day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> any any other questions I can answer? If not, I'm happy to turn it back over to Dr. Douglas to wrap up. I think you have a good collaboration blooming here. And uh, Oliver would be a great resource for any of the doc students interested in, su in supply chain issues as well. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. I'm really glad that you were able to present despite you know, having the research extended over a longer period of time than the original grant, but we're excited that you could go and do that field research and get the interviews done now. And I can't wait to hear about the book as you're working on it and finishing that. Thank so you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you everyone for being here. I'm looking forward to seeing you at our events throughout the week.